your body produces a nutrient that you can increase through your diet. And a big study shows that flooding this nutrient into cancer cells leads to some remarkable switches. Specifically, it stresses and kills cancer cells. The idea is that as many cancers feed on sugar, glucose for energy, among other reasons, we can take advantage of that preference by introducing a particular fat. But it can't be just any fat because this one is special due to its size and its shape. You see, a century ago, a cancer concept called the Warburg effect was introduced. The Warburg effect is when cells turn cancerous, they also reduce their dependence on fat metabolism for energy and focus heavily on glucose for energy. The same blood glucose that's coursing through your veins right now. There are multiple reasons cancer cells switch, but I have a lot of incredible things to show you, so we'll leave it there for now, just knowing that they do. Researchers can measure how aggressive cancer cells have shifted to glucose metabolism by measuring the production of the first step in the glucose metabolizing system, called glycolysis. This first step, the moment that glucose enters the cell, is to trap glucose into the cancer cell by adding a tag, a phosphate, to it, creating a new molecule called glucose 6-phosphate. We can see that data here. We're measuring G6P, or glucose 6-phosphate levels, so the higher the bar, the more G6P. The cancer cells are exposed to high glucose, prime for the Warburg effect, or low glucose environment, disabling the Warburg effect. Clearly, the high glucose leads to a significant increase. In fact, as further evidenced here, as the researchers have added a mitotracker, a dye, to the cancer cells to identify two things. One, the total number of mitochondria in green, and two, the oxidative mitochondria, meaning mitochondria that are producing cellular energy, likely through fat metabolism. Remember, that shouldn't be happening if the cancer cells are undergoing the Warburg effect. Then there's an overlap in yellow to identify both at once. We have the low glucose condition, the high glucose condition, non-cancerous colon cells from humans and mice. The cancer cells are human, FYI. And we can clearly see that mitochondria green exist in every single condition, but the red is largely extinguished when cancer cells are given a high glucose environment, again, indicating the Warburg effect. This is also measured quantitatively in the bar graphs to the right. The thing is, researchers aren't just concerned with the shifts in metabolism, but also how cancer cells change their gene expression, as in how cancer cells read their genes to produce the appropriate proteins to function. Unfortunately for cancer cells, researchers have identified fat that interferes with the whole cancer process. That fat is called butyrate, and it's unique in some key ways that relate to its structure and size that lend itself well to hurting cancer cells. But the way that it hurts cancer cells is actually heavily gene-related. Still, let me throw a wrench into the statement, butyrate hurts cancer cells. Does it, though? If we pop open these data, we're looking at the sheer number of cells at varying levels of butyrate exposure, so listed on the horizontal axis. As we're talking about primarily about cancer cells, we want those bars to go down. There are, however, three conditions, a Warburg effect, high glucose cancer cells, a non-Warburg cancer cells exposed to low glucose, and a third condition, which we actually won't worry about. It's a lactate dehydrogenase knockdown. Focus on the two non-black bars and compare against the zero butyrate condition. Notice how, yes, greater butyrate concentrations seem to reduce cancer cell count, but what's going on with the lower concentrations? There seems to be an increase in cancer cell count, meaning butyrate is stimulating cancer cells. Actually, we see that across multiple lines of evidence, including DNA synthesis. Keep in mind, cancer cells, when they duplicate, have to also duplicate their genome. So the researchers add a DNA tag called BRDU that is incorporated into the DNA. Here, we again see the low concentrations of butyrate stimulate DNA synthesis in cancer cells compared to when butyrate is not there. Yet at higher concentrations, it reduces DNA synthesis. We'll come back to why butyrate both stimulates cancer cells and hurts them, including what to do about it. Before that, though, I'd like to show you a final experiment on the stress that cancer experiences with butyrate. 
This is called an annexin-5 experiment. Essentially, annexin-5 is a protein that binds these molecules found on the cell membrane called phosphatidylserines. In healthy cells, phosphatidylserine is found on the inside of the cell membrane. But in early stages of programmed cell death, the cell will expose the intersection of the membrane to the outside. It literally flips the section of the cell membrane to expose them to the outside environment. I think that's such a cool experiment. That's where annexin-5 can bind these molecules. Scientists can detect that and determine which cells are dying and which cells are alive. There's another component called PI, or propidium iodide, but we'll focus on the former. Anyway, here, we're looking at an XN5 and PI staining by flow cytometry. Essentially, all you need to know is that we're looking is if the cells identified by the colors are trending toward the top right quadrant. That indicates more cell death as there's more an XN5 and PI present on and in the cells. We can clearly see that greater butyrate leads to more cancer cells suffering death. Off with their heads. Okay, so the butyrate paradox. You have to flood the cancer cells with butyrate to knock them off kilter because if you don't, you may be helping them. Now let's figure out what butyrate is doing inside the cancer cells that's leading to these effects. And then we'll come to understand what to do. I briefly mentioned that cancer cells also change their gene expression and one of the ways that they do that is through the process called acetylation. Your genes, and by extension cancerous genes, are wrapped up around these protein structures called histones. The cell can add or remove tags, known as acetyl tags, to the histones, which changes if the histones are closed up or open for the genes around them to be read by gene-reading complexes. However, in certain cancer cells, there is reduced acetylation to lock up the certain genes, typically anti-cancer genes. However, what happens when the cells take up butyrate? Well, look here. We're looking at the general acetylation levels up top and the histones themselves in the middle and a control protein on the bottom. Unless you have experience with that Western blot analysis, I'll just focus on the top two. We're measuring the relative and absolute levels of acetylation, these tags on the histones. When the cancer cells are exposed to butyrate on the bottom, the darker and larger the splotch, the more there is. So clearly at the higher butyrate concentrations, there's more universal acetylation and possibly opening of the histones. But we don't need to stop there because there's histone independent acetylation and there's a powerful protein in your cells that acts as a master anti-tumor factor. It's called P53. Unfortunately, in many cancers, P53 is inactivated in some way. However, acetylating P53 can enhance its stability and DNA binding abilities. So, what happens? The same principles. Up top we have the acetylated version, the more stable version, and below that is the actual protein, not necessarily acetylated. So, there's no change in the actual protein, but there's an increase in the stable version. That indicates that butyrate not only influences the genes, but also affects the anti-cancer proteins inside the cell. Okay, enough cell biology. Why does butyrate promote cancer and yet also shut it down? And how do we use this information? Or if you're an uber nerd like me, there's two distinct effects that butyrate has in your cells based on the concentration found around your cells. And there's some people who don't generate much butyrate, even when they eat the right foods. And more specifics, on those foods and even butyrate dosing. I'll be discussing some of that coming up, but if you want even more detailed analysis with even more specific takeaways, consider joining the Physionic Insiders. It's my premium research platform that gives you full access to all my work, plus a private podcast, live sessions with me, protocols and guides, weekly articles delivered to you and more. It's a steal and I'm proud to continuously work to improve it. You can check it out in the description box. We saw multiple lines of evidence that butyrate increases cancer cell number and then suddenly crushes them. Well, we've been focused on colon cells. Even the cancer cells are colon cells. And if we look at the data on the colon and the general butyrate concentrations, they change based on the section of the colon that you're referring to here. The proximal here, the medial about here, and the distal here. So that might raise this concern that cancer will 
only be killed by the proximal sections and not be killed in the medial or distal. Well, this is where the researchers have some words of wisdom because they address two things. One, if we zoom into your colon, there's these crypts which have been made by an assortment of cells. The top part is made up of differentiated, meaning cells that have chosen their job, epithelial cells, and the lower sections are a mixture of cells. But this is where cancer usually occurs because there are stem cells here too. The researchers point out that there's also lower butyrate concentrations here too, which again raises this worry that butyrate could be feeding the cancer then. Here's the thing though. Cancer cells undergoing the Warburg effect don't metabolize butyrate, even at low concentration. So butyrate bypasses metabolism and acts on the genes, like we described with the greater concentrations of acetyl groups on the appropriate proteins, the histones, P53, and so on. If we revisit those first data that scared us, there's a key factor here that we didn't go over. The cells undergoing Warburg are diminished even at low concentrations. It's only cancer cells forced to stop the Warburg effect that duplicate more with, you, with butyrate addition. We'll come back to that. Okay, two, the amount of butyrate that we produce is quite high, assuming that you're eating the right foods, and likely exceeds throughout the colon the levels that we have in this study. So this all means that butyrate metabolizing capable cells like your colonocytes get the advantage of a butyrate boost in proliferation, but Warburg-centric cancer cells have a disadvantage, even at low concentrations, but even more so at high concentrations. Still, that leaves us with a few pieces of context to mention, because there's a few outstanding questions before we finish the, our journey here. One, this was largely in human cells, which we don't translate to humans directly without more proof in humans. Fortunately, the researchers acknowledge that there are human studies indicating that butyrate-centric foods are linked to reduce cancer. In fact, they even mention a study where researchers identified reduced butyrate-producing bacteria in people with colorectal cancer compared to healthy individuals. This, of course, isn't cause and effect evidence, but now we have multiple lines indicating that butyrate-producing bacteria play a role. Number two, some cancer feed on fat. So while yes, many cancers undergo this Warburg effect, not all do. And in fact, the researchers focused on one type of colorectal cancer, and there are others. So this seems useful for the majority, but may not be for all. Still, there's no way of knowing until a person has cancer, and the butyrate-promoting foods are consistently linked to reduce cancer. So we probably shouldn't worry about the minority of cases and aim for the best case now. That means if you want to increase butyrate levels and drown these types of cancers, you'll want to eat foods that these bacteria in your gut take and turn into butyrate, which is dietary fiber-rich foods. Some examples are things like green bananas, plantains, onions, garlic, potatoes, and there are plenty more sources out there. That said, the main takeaways here are that for most cancer types, those feeding on glucose, sugar, there's some evidence that the short-chain fat butyrate hurts them and kills them. However, this may be the opposite in low doses for non-Warber cancers, a minority of cancers. Generally, butyrate-stimulating foods high in dietary fiber are associated with reduced cancer overall. Now, did you know that while fiber is an excellent choice for cancer, there's other gut health supplements and nutrients that might be detrimental and make cancer progression worse? Well, now you do, and I detail it all right here.